Story Time with Bill. This is another program in a series devoted to the magical world of story. In this series, you'll hear folk tales, myths, legends, and fairy tales. Some of them will be familiar to you, and some will not be so familiar. But each story will have a nugget of truth about human nature. I'm not going to tell you what that truth is, but someday when you tell the story yourself in your own words, you'll say, aha, and you'll have grasped the nugget of truth. My name is Bill Dunlap, and I'm your storyteller. There were four young men who grew up in a rural village in a remote part of India. They were childhood friends. Three of the young boys wanted to become scholars, and so they read everything they could get their hands on. But the fourth young boy, why, he, he was content to go hunting and fishing and laze around in the sun. He didn't know how to read, he didn't know how to write, and he didn't care about it. The only thing he was known for was having an unusual amount of common sense. When the young men grew into adulthood, they sat around one day talking about what they were going to do with their knowledge. They knew that they couldn't use their knowledge in the village because the village was poor, the people were ignorant, they had no education. In order to determine whether their knowledge was real and useful, they had to get to the large city. So they decided to go to Delhi. Three scholars thought, well, what are we going to do if we go to Delhi? And, and are we going to take the young man who can't, can't read and write? And they thought, well, no, that's not fair. We've, we've always been friends. And to leave him behind, why, his, it would hurt his feelings. And besides, he's always good company. So they thought, the, the three scholars decided to take the young man with them. And the four of them started off through the jungle. Oh, they walked for days and days through the jungle. And finally, they spoke a pile of bones along the trail. The young man said, uh, said, Oh, I know what those bones are. Those are the bones of a lion. And through my studies, I know how to put them in the exact position they would be if the lion were a living, moving animal. A second scholar said, Yes. And through my studies, I know how to put skin and muscle and blood in that and all around those bones, and put on the lion's skin. And the third scholar said, Yes, and I know how to breathe life into the lion. The young man who was not a scholar, but only had common sense, said, Oh, now wait, wait, think about what you're doing. They said, No, 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 we know what we're doing. We're going to bring that lion back to life, and we're going to take him along with us to Delhi, and the Raj is going to be so impressed, we tell him what we've done, why he's going to reward us, he'll give us medals, we'll be known throughout the kingdom. The young man said, I know, but supposing that lion is hungry, the lion has been dead for many, many years, perhaps, and, and when you bring him back to life, I know he's going to be hungry, what if he springs upon you and eats you up? They said, no, 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 that won't happen. Why, that lion will be a pet. He'll be so grateful we've brought him back to life. He won't bother us at all. Well, the man with common sense said, Wait a minute, before you do that, let me climb a tree just to be in the safe side. The three scholars talked among themselves. They said, Listen, if he doesn't trust us, he doesn't believe in what we're doing, why, we do not want any, want any part of him. So he can climb up his tree, he can stay in the tree, but we're going to take the line and go on to Delhi. We're not going to share with our wealth with him. So they breathed, they breathed life into the lion. The first thing the lion did, he started to wag his tail. Then he stood up in his hind legs. He let out a mighty roar. And then he looked at the three scholars standing around admiring him. So he leaped on them and he ate them all out. But after he'd finished his meal, he wandered off into the jungle, 
to lie down and rest while he digested it. The young man up in the tree watched the whole proceedings. And when the, young, the lion had wandered off, he climbed down from the tree and walked back into the village. He didn't come back with any medals from the Raj. He didn't come back with any chunks of gold. All he took back with him was what he left with, his common sense. When King Arthur was at home, one of his favorite pastimes was to go hunting. So one day, dressed in his hunting greens and armed only with his bow, he set off down a trail to, to, to hunt for deer. And when he, took, he picked a trail that he'd really not explored before, but he, he liked to, to know what was going on in the lands around Camelot. And so he went down the trail and he didn't see anything. So he kept riding and riding. Finally he saw a great stag leap across his path. Arthur quickly fitted an arrow to his bow and he drew back. And as he did so, a knight all in black armor and waving a silver sword over his head rode out and said, You are trespassing on my lands. I am going to cut your head off. <coughs> Arthur said, Wait. Wait, wait a minute. If you take my life while I am thus unarmed, and you will be banished from every land, every castle in the land. Now, let me go, and I promise you that I will return armed with my sword Excalibur, and that we'll have a fair fight. Please, let me go, and I'll return. That is, if you dare. The knight in black armor said, No, you can go only if you promise to return to this exact spot in exactly one year, armed only as you are today, with only your bow and arrow. Your only armament will be the answer to a riddle which I shall give you. And if you get the answer correctly, why then I will spare your life. Arthur said, Oh, lay the riddle on me. There's never been a riddle that I that I couldn't solve. In my whole life I could I've solved every riddle that's been posed to me. The knight in black armor said, Well, you may not solve this one so easily. You come back in one year and you tell me what it is that women want most. Arthur said, oh, that's no problem at all. I'll just ask every, every female in my kingdom, and I'm sure that I'll get the answer that you're looking for. So Arthur rode back to the castle, and he asked his wife, Guinevere, what is it, dear, that women want most? And she said, sire, my greatest desire is to please you and to do your bidding. Arthur was very happy with that answer, so he asked the other wives of his knights, and they gave him the same answer. Why, our only desire is to please our husband and to do his bidding. Arthur wasn't quite satisfied with that. So he went along and out in the kingdom and he asked every girl child, every maiden, every young woman, every mother, and every grandmother what it was that women most desired. Some of them said power, others said youth, some said beauty, and some even said sleep. Well, the year had passed, Arthur had talked to every woman in the kingdom, and he was certain that he didn't have an acceptable answer. So exactly one year later, dressed in his hunting greens and armed only with his bow, he set off on what he thought would be his last journey into the woods. He asked his nephew, Sir Gawain, to ride along with him so that he could bring his body back to the castle. And as Arthur was riding through the forest, all of a sudden he heard the most beautiful music he'd ever heard in his life. And he came to a small opening in the forest, and he looked into the glen, and he saw 
fairy dancing around the mound. The sight of, of the fairies was so beautiful that Arthur had to divert his eyes. And when he looked back, the fairies were gone. The only thing he saw was an old hag sitting on the mound. Why, she was the ugliest, ugliest person that Arthur had ever seen in his life. Her skin was parched and dried like an old dried up riverbed. Her hands were all twisted and gnarled from arthritis. Her teeth, her incisors hung down over her jaws just like the incisors of a wolf and her hair was all spiky with dirt and grime. Her body was covered with sores and the only thing she wore was an animal skin and the smell was horrible. She said, King Arthur, my name is Dame Ragna and I have the answer to the riddle you, you seek. Please stop and listen to me. Arthur pulled his horse up short and said, if you have the answer to the riddle, please give it to me, otherwise I'm riding to my death. Dame Ragna said, not so fast, sire. If I give you the answer that saves your life, will you in return give me what is my heart's most desire? Arthur said, well, if it's within my power to do so, I will gladly give you your heart's desire. Dame Ragna said, well then bend your ear and I'll give you the answer to the riddle. Arthur leaned down and she spoke into his ear and he said, you know, I should have thought of that because as a man that's exactly what I would want. So with a lighter heart, Arthur spurred his horse on towards the castle where lived the knight in black armor. When he got near the castle, he saw the knight coming out, waving his silver sword in the air, and the knight said, Ha! This time I'm going to have your head. Arthur said, No, wait, wait. I have the answer to your riddle. What women most desire is sovereignty. Oh, ye gads! You must have talked to my stepsister, Dame Ragno. She's the only one who knew the answer to that riddle. And with that, the knight's horse reared up, and he fell to the ground and broke into a thousand shards. Then Arthur heard a rumbling noise, and he looked up, and he saw the castle starting to crumble. It fell to the ground, and Arthur was surrounded with a cloud of dust. And when the dust settled, there was the hag approaching him. She said, Sire, I have given you the answer that saved your life. Now will you give me my heart's desire? Arthur said, If it's within my power to do so, I will gladly give you what you want. He said, What I want is for the fairest knight on your round table to ask for my hand in marriage. Arthur thought, Whoa, now wait a minute here. Um, I really don't think you'd be very happy uh, living at Camelot and married to a knight. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you your own castle. You'll have your own servants. And you'll have a pension. You can live very, very well by yourself. Dame Ragnar said, Sire, a gentleman and a king never goes back on his word. You promised me that you would honor my request and let me marry the finest knight of your round table. Sir Gawain had heard all of this and he knew what his allegiance was. It was to the king. So he dismounted from his horse he walked up to Dame Ragnall and he knelt before her and he said, My dear woman, you have saved my sire's life. Would you please be my wife? Dame Ragnall looked at him, smiled and said, Exactly! So, Sir Gawain helped Dame Ragnall get on the back of his horse and they rode back to the castle. When they got to the castle, all the men and women and knights gathered around the throne and asked Arthur what had happened. 
Arthur told him the story and said, and Dame Ragnall, for her help, wanted to marry one of the knights of my round table, and Sir Gawain has proposed to her, and she has accepted his proposal. Oh, the lady said, no, 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 not Sir Gawain. Why, he is the finest, the noblest, the handsomest knight of the round table. Say it's a mistake. No, don't let it happen. Arthur said, I've given my word. And that night there was a wedding and a great wedding feast. Oh, the table was laden with all types of great foods and drink. Genevieve asked Dame Ragnall to, to change her clothes and get into a bridal gown. But Dame Ragnall said, no, I'm going exactly as I am. So she went to the wedding table dressed in her animal skin. But the smell was so terrible and she looked like such an old hag that all the other guests lost their appetites but not Dame Ragnall. She reached out and she grabbed the whole side of venison and she started gnawing on it with, with her huge incisor teeth. Juices ran down her face and down onto her animal skin. She picked up vegetables, massive amounts of vegetables in both hands and stuffed them into her mouth. She stuffed a fruit and cakes and washed them all down with plenty of drink. Oh, it was such a disgusting sight that all of the other guests got up and left the table. When everybody was finished, King Arthur said, Now it's time for dancing. But he looked around and there were no guests. They had all gone. So Genevieve said, Arthur, don't you think it's time that we escorted this young couple to the bridal suite? Gawain swallowed hard, but the king and the queen escorted Dame Ragnall and Sir Gawain up to the bridal suite. They got inside and they closed the door and Dame Ragnall said, My dear sweet husband, won't you give your bride a kiss? Gawain said, oh, Excuse me, but you know, it's been a long, hard day and I have a terrible headache. Can't we wait until the morning? Dame Ragnall looked at him and said, You have refused me on our wedding night. You are not as chivalrous as they say. Well, in those days, Saying that a knight wasn't chivalrous towards women was worse than calling him a coward in battle. So Gawain said, I had my reasons. You're not rich. You're not of noble birth. And you're very old. She said, Gawain, you don't even know me. Look into my eyes. And Gawain looked into her eyes. He saw something beautiful, and then he heard her speak. And she said, Nobility is not born in the blood of a child, passed down from daughter to son. Nobility is the sum of the work that one has done, and the good that one has done. As for youth, I've turned that page, but I can bring you the beauty and the wisdom of my age. Gawain was so overcome with the sweet sound of her voice and the deep blue eyes. So he reached out and he picked up her gnarled hand and he impulsively kissed it. And when he looked out, there was not an old hag standing in front of him, but a beautiful young maiden with blue eyes and long golden hair. He said, sorcery! sorcery, the black arts. I want no part of this. Get out of the castle. Get yourself lost. Don't ever come back. She said, Go away. It is not I who was the sorceress. It was my evil stepmother. Stepmother. When, when I was a child, she enchanted my brother to, to wear black armor and to challenge people who trespassed on our land. And she enchanted me to be an old hag till a fine knight would ask me to be his wife of his own accord. She said, Gawain, you have lifted half the spell. Gawain's half the spell? Yes. To remove the other half of the spell, you must choose very, very carefully. 
You can have me either as a beautiful maiden by day and a hag at night, or you can have me a hag by night, and or you can even have me a, a hag by day and a beautiful maiden by night. Gawain thought that was a very, very difficult choice. If she was a hag during the day, why then the court would wouldn't accept her. They would make smart remarks about her. And if she was a hag by night, why he wouldn't want to have anything to do with her either. So he said, my dear, as that this choice is a matter of your happiness, it is not for me to choose. It is for you. She put her arms around Gawain's neck and she kissed him and says, Oh, my dear husband, you have completely reduced the spell. You have given me sovereignty, the right to make my own choices and to rule my own life. I choose to forever remain in my youthful maiden form until time and time alone turns these golden hairs to silver. That night there were a thousand, maybe ten thousand kisses that lasted through the night and halfway through the day. And in the afternoon, when Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnall came back down into the court, Gawain told the, the court what had transpired. Arthur thought that was so magnificent that he ordered another wedding feast. And that night people dined in style. They all ate, they all drank, and they danced well on into the night. And that gave rise to the term, Merry England. And as far as I know, they are singing and dancing even until today. There was a young hunter living in, in Sweden. His house was right along the, the, the rocky shore. He lived there with his mother. And one day as he was walking along the, the shoreline with his rifle, he saw three swans flying towards him. They landed on a sandy beach, a little cove. And he watched as the swans took off their feathers and danced on the sand and they got into the water. And he looked at them. They were so beautiful. But there was one swan the youngest one that was the most beautiful of all. And he looked and looked at her. Oh, his heart went out there. He wondered, how could I possibly ever possess her? After a while, the swans came out of the water. They put their, their feathers back on and they flew off. The young man was smitten. He went home and he saw his mother. And he told his mother what he had seen. He told her how he had fallen in love with the most beautiful creature he'd ever seen in his life. And he stopped working. He stopped eating. He stopped tilling the land. Had no joy in hunting. He was very depressed. His mother said, Oh, you've, you've got to get, take control of yourself. But he said, I love that swan. I, I can't, don't want to live without her. His mother said, I'll tell you what to do. On the next Thursday evening, you go down along the beach and when the swans come in you find out where the beautiful swan that you love put her feathers and then you re go down and you steal them. So the next Thursday evening the young man watched the swans fly down and land. He watched them take off the feathers and he took great care to notice where the youngest most beautiful swan put her feathers. Then he knelt down and he took them and he hid them. When the swans came out of the water, two swans put their feathers on and flew away. But the third swan, why, she was naked. She was crying. She was sobbing on the beach. The young man went back to his house and he got a, a blanket and wrapped it around her and took her home. It wasn't long before the young man and the, and the young maiden fell in love and they were married. And they had a, a happy life. They'd been married for seven years. And then one Thursday evening, after seven years of happy marriage, they had a hearty dinner and lots of wine. And they went out and they sat on the porch. 
And maybe it was the too much wine, but the young hunter became very talkative. He told his wife how he had stolen her feathers and hid them away so that she couldn't fly away and that he could possess her. And I'm sure he brain was numbed a little bit by the wine so he went out to his barn and he came out with all the swan's feathers she touched them held them to her breast and instantly she was transformed into a swan and she flew away never to return again the young man was heart stricken he was depressed he was discouraged he didn't eat he didn't drink he didn't do anything, he lay about in his bed, pining for his vanished wife. And one year and a day after she had disappeared, he died a mournful death and was laid to rest in the village churchyard. Now, sometimes if you get something through a dishonest act, it'll bring you joy for the moment. But in the long run, it will bring you great misery. My stories for today are all told out. If you found these stories entertaining or informative, then that's because you have love and compassion in your hearts. If you found them otherwise, then that's my fault. Because after all, I was the storyteller. You can contact me at 408-776-7662 or you can send me an email at wndstories at earthlink.net.